uh, Ruth. Um, I think, yeah, we had a colleague from, a colleague from Jordan who, who had troubles with uh, a Zoom, I think, but might not be the link itself. No, there was somebody else, somebody oh, else who got the notification and then couldn't, couldn't log on for some okay, reason. Maybe, uh, Ruth, you can put, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure how to manage that. Um, So you got the notification through email? Yeah, I shared the link that was working for me. So maybe you could try sending that one in the chat. Yeah, we can. Well, I mean, in the chat would not make a difference, but uh, let's see. No, it, I'll share that along. It was um, our colleague Erica who was trying to to log on, but no worries. Go ahead. I'm here. All good. Maybe one more minute. I hope colleagues can join using the link. I think now we have about 30 colleagues and participants on board, so maybe I suggest we start um, because there is a lot to be shared today, obviously. Um, so good morning, uh, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on where uh, you are. I'm, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Nathalie Boucher. I'm the... Uh, leading uh, the UNDP BPPS Inclusive Growth Team uh, at Interim now. Um, I've been uh, leading uh, on the development of this uh, informal economy facility, which is actually the actual host of this uh, event. Um, the informal economy facility, just to demystify a little bit, um, is actually um, an initiative that uh, UNDP has been uh, uh, developing in the wake of COVID-19 um, with a view to sort of strengthen uh, UNDP positioning on informality issues. And we know that uh, informality is, is, a, is a, um, and, and within the UN system in particular is quite a, an issue that is addressed by many actors, uh, it's a pretty crowded field. So the whole idea here was also to try to think um, more innovatively on how we could address uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, facing uh, informal economy actors, uh, but also how we can best leverage opportunities uh, uh, within the informal economy. And, and there is, Basically, our focus is on to uh, um, our vision uh, rather than focus is that informal economy actors cannot be merely seen as you know vulnerable. They are also actors and agents of change. 
So the, um, for UNDP, the UNDP's work on informality is not only about pr expanding protections for informal economy actors, it's also about empowering them uh, to be actors of changes, you know. Um, and on this, uh, there is a specific work stream we want to push and dig deeper into is the nexus uh, between innovation, the informal economy, uh, and how this nexus can be leveraged and packed to foster pathways potentially towards formality. We don't use the word formalization. We try not to use the word formalization uh, <laughs> uh, in UNDP or at least in the context of the informal economy uh, facility uh, with this notion that first there is not a single pathway to formality. Um, and that's something we will uh, explore uh, today, obviously. Uh, and secondly, that formalization uh, cannot be achieved overnight, that formalization cannot only be uh, approached from a normative uh, viewpoint. Uh, hence the importance of this conversation today, which is one of uh, the kickoff uh, webinar of our facility. Um, <clears throat> we are uh, really, um, privilege today to have uh, speakers uh, from um, from our accelerator lab and let me uh, seize this opportunity to thank Gina Eduardo and all colleagues uh, uh, who joined uh, this uh, this uh, discussion and uh, discussion space but also our eminent speakers we have on board um, Mr. Um, Robson was like a long-standing experience in digging uh, deep in uh, innovative processes within the informal uh, economy. Uh, and on this, I would like to make a, a quick point. I mean, when we look at the nexus between innovation, the informal economy, and, and thinking about this nexus from the viewpoint of fostering pathways to formality, I think there are so many lens through which we can look at this nexus. One, of course, is to see whether innovate, innovative solutions, innovation like digitalization uh, <clears throat> can be a pathway uh, uh, to empower uh, informal uh, actors, business or workers uh, uh, and create some sort of incentives or enabling conditions for them to to move or to go formal, but um, interestingly also, and that's something that's perhaps less, uh, less studied is how, um, what does innovation means within the informal economy? And, 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 and I would like again to thank Erika to join, uh, to, to be there and, and uh, for being here today and to facilitate this discussion, because I know this is exactly the angle through which uh, uh, organization is looking at uh, innovation, uh, not like leveraging uh, digital solutions to, 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 to foster those transitions, but what is happening in terms of innovation within informal economy, between in terms of product processes. And during the COVID-19 crisis, we saw actually uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis have, uh, has also unveiled a lot of innovations in the informal sector. So the key question, if we think about it from a, the viewpoint of pathways to formalities, how can we connect the dots between, between innovations that are taking place within the informal economy and the broader formal system, you know, and how can this, uh, these connections be uh, leveraged to, 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 to help uh, informal actors possibly graduate towards uh, uh, formality. I will stop here uh, and without further delay, we'll end over to our colleague uh, Erika uh, Kramambula, uh, uh, top notch expert on those issues to uh, set the scene better than I did uh, <laughs> uh, for the discussion today. Over to you, Erika. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Natalie. Um, I'll start and, and I'll start by um, just getting my slides ready. I hope everybody can see them well. Yes? Yes. Great. Okay. Yes, okay. we can. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and um, good day, everyone. Um, 
it's really a pleasure to be here and thanks for the opportunity um, uh, to participate and to speak. I will, I think the most uh, substantial issues will be coming uh, from the presentations that are that are about to 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 um to happen. So uh, I'm just here taking a, a few minutes to sort of set the scene and uh, and raise a few sort of general uh, issues about that connection. Um, uh, as Natalie um, uh, very well introduced between innovation, informality, and the and the formal uh, broader system, which is the topic of this uh, of this webinar. So um, just very briefly, there are, there are various reasons why um, we should care about the informal economy, and I think everybody in there, I'm, I'm speaking here to the converted uh, uh, already, but um, but uh, there are various reasons why we should care about the, the informal economy, but perhaps the most convincing one is its prevalence, is, is, is widespread, um, it affects uh, labor markets in all countries, especially developing regions, but also uh, in high income countries. And the way it manifests is quite context specific. So even though we see it uh, playing out uh, in different parts of the world, it's important to be reminded of its diversity and its context uh, specificity. Uh, it's, it's, it's often um, that we hear references to the informal economy as something that is homogeneous, um, uh, but this, this, uh, the reality is very far from that. Uh, the informal economy is as diverse as the as the formal economy, and it has many uh, activities from manufacturing, uh, services, construction, waste collection, uh, uh, and so on. We'll hear about about some of those more concretely uh, in the presentations that are to come. So this diversity is important uh, uh, in the discussions around the pathways uh, to formalization, as uh, Natalie. Uh, mentioned now, because different sectors and activities will follow um, uh, different paths and present uh, different opportunities and challenges. So it's important to bear this in mind. Uh, these activities are, are very much driven by the demand uh, for low cost uh, goods and services, often from low income um, uh, uh, consumers, and often in areas where the access to formal markets is quite limited. Um, and informal actors uh, often operate at a very local level. So the local dynamics are, are extremely relevant when trying to understand the informal sector. This is not to say that they are isolated from, uh, from global dynamics. We um, see, for instance, the, the cheap, import, cheap um, imports from, from, from Asia, for instance, do affect opportunities by informal actors, but in the day-to-day -day operations very much relates to local dynamics. Um, as, as Natalie also mentioned, there is important to keep in mind these two phases of informality. Um, uh, there is a very strong link. On the one hand, there's a very strong link between informality and poverty, um, uh, low productivity and earnings, and, and, and the precariousness of, of, of jobs uh, and lack of social protection and vulnerability. Uh, but there's also another side of informality that has to do with employment opportunities and livelihoods. It provides a source of uh, entrepreneurship uh, for social integration and inclusion, in some cases, skill develop, skills development and, and, and a source of creativity and innovation, which is um, uh, what we want to discuss uh, uh, in, this, in, this, um, in this seminar. Um, also, in, in some cases, uh, there's evidence that shows that the informal economy can make a contribution to resilience and environmental sustainability. So it adheres to these principles of circularity. Uh, of reusing, repurposing, um, uh, and recycling. Um, there are different conceptualizations uh, of the informal economy. Uh, I will not go through them um, in detail, but I think it's good to put a sort of a, a bit of context to, to how, um, which kind of conceptualization uh, 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 do we see ourselves more more connected uh, to and understand sort of the the range uh, um, uh, of of perspectives that exist? Uh, these perspectives often uh, compete with each other, and they cascade into policy approaches that embed uh, these perspectives. Um, but uh, but I'll argue that you need all of these multi um, uh, layers, multiple layers of conceptualizations to really grasp the reality of, of and the complexity of the informal economy. So the first one is this interpretation of uh, the informal economy as a residual, uh, as a leftover of, of modernization. And this underlying narrative of this view uh, is that as countries modernize, uh, uh, the informal economy will naturally uh, disappear. Um, the formal economy is seen as progress and then the informal economy is regressive. 
and uh, and this view also sees the the informal economy as as opposite to the formal economy. Is this binary? Is embedded this idea of of um, uh, a binary uh, a, a binary view uh, or hierarchy in some in some respects of of economic activity? So it often leads to an, a, a representation of the informal economy as something that highlights its negative attributes and impacts. And this has been a very predominant uh, lens uh, for a long time. Um, and it still remains in, 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 in many cases. Then there's, there's a second and not unrelated view of informality as a byproduct of uh, globalization and intensified competition. And this view highlights this global dynamics uh, where employers and companies seek to reduce costs and, uh, and adopt these informal uh, arrangements that are affecting labor standards, what is often referred to as a race to the bottom or impoverishing growth. Um, and, um, and this year very much focuses on the status of uh, the precariousness, precariousness of work uh, and issues around social protection as well. Uh, a third lens uh, is the informal economy as an alternative to the formal economy, a response to an overregulated or dysfunctional formal context. Um, and, uh, and this view seeks for portrays the informal economy as these um, actors that are seeking freedom and flexibility. Um, it's very, very predominant, for instance, in the, uh, or it's got its origins very much in the, in the Latin American uh, context and the observation of the of the of regulation and the and the effect of the regulatory system in 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 a, in, in, in in affecting sort of the informal actors. Um, there's another view that um, of those that see the informal economy as a complement to the formal economy, um, complementary in the sense that they see it as as growing in tandem. Uh, where fairly affluent populations uh, and, and households who many par mainly participate in the formal economy also are seen as, as main, mainly beneficiaries of the informal economy. And finally is the view of the informal economy as a source of entrepreneurship and a test bed for innovation where actors develop solutions in conditions of scarcity and they do things in new ways and uh, experiment and often uh, come up with, uh, with new ways uh, of, of, of doing that are spread and disseminated to the rest of the economy. And this has been often referred to as this hidden engine for, for innovation. So this is the, the, um, the, 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 light, the last uh, conceptualization is, is perhaps the one that we want to focus a little bit more, but it's important to note that there's no single characterization um, that, um, that really captures uh, the complexity of, of, the, of the informal economy. And uh, the reality is that the lift practice is multi-layered, multifaceted, and overlapping. And one can say that you need to uh, understand this, this spectrum uh, of, of conceptualization and the context in which um, the informal economy takes place to be able to um, uh, characterize it um, more accurately. So in the last couple of minutes, I want to mention that this, uh, that uh, digging a little bit deeper into this last characterization, um, there's evidence uh, of, of innovation uh, uh, in, the, in the literature. Um, increasingly, uh, there's been a, a, a growing uh, uh, body of evidence that shows that, that, in, uh, that the informal, informal actors are not uninventive. They are, there is innovative behavior by, by informal entrepreneurs. And um, and this innovation takes, you know, is, is, uh, has specific features. It may not be new to the world, but it's new to the firm, new to the context in which it takes place, and it tends to be uh, in incremental. It tends to be significant improvements to existing products, processes, um, rather than radical uh, uh, innovations. And there's also um, uh, a literature that shows us that there are different types of businesses. There's this and the size of the firm uh, matters. So micro enterprises tend to be uh, survivalist and tend to be uh, informal. But then when you see the, the, um, the similarities between formal and informal businesses, when you go larger in size to, from micro to smaller firms, they tend to share similar challenges. Um, so size matters and age also matters. Uh, uh, firms that have been uh, operating for longer Tend to um, tend to there's, there's a natural sort of uh, incentive in some cases to to formalize and many uh, about two thirds of the businesses globally uh, start informally and then gradually um, uh, formalize. So it's important to debunk some of these myths uh, of uh, informal and formal as a binary 
Uh, there's not enough attention that has been given to uh, the levels of informality, of all formality. How does it happen? Uh, formalization is a gradual process and there are different pathways to formalization. Um, also debunking the myth that informal is an inventive. So there's ample evidence of um, creativity and innovation emerging from the informal economy, uh, often with transformational social impacts. And this idea of informal as individual units, uh, and I'll, I'll just touch on it very briefly, uh, but uh, it's important to remember that informal economic activities are part of a system. Uh, there's a constellation of actors that support, collaborate, compete with informal uh, and formal actors, exchanging knowledge, goods, uh, and ideas. And, and it's important to, to, to keep that pers systemic, systemic perspective of the, of the informal economy. So um, rather than portraying uh, formal and informal entrepreneurs as, as, as binary opposites, there's a growing recognition of these degrees of, uh, of informality as a continuum from fully informal to uh, fully formal. So there's a, a big gray area in the middle. Um, and uh, informal entrepreneurs will sit at different, uh, um, uh, at different uh, spaces in that, in that sort of continuum of formality. Um, this is in recognition, as I mentioned, that many of the enterprises sort of start informally and then some of them remain informal, some others formalize over time through different avenues and at different speeds. And this is what we're trying to unpack in this, in this, in this webinar. Um, I will not go through the idea of what these different degrees of informality are, but uh, it's interesting to note that often we see this formalization as you know moving from informal to formal um, but there are there are many other pathways and routes uh, of increasingly um, moving along or progressing along this uh, continuum of, of formality um, uh, that that are worth exploring and that are that are sort of still very very uh, nascent in the literature we've also seen during covid a move in the other direction from formal to informal and the, the um, uh, moving along the, the opposite uh, um, uh, direction of the spectrum of formality as well. So uh, to advance along this degree of these degrees of formalization, firms uh, or businesses or actors they face a race of challenges, of drivers, of opportunities, and and, and impacts. And uh, the literature has has explored several of this. I hope uh, we can we can touch. Uh, on some of these in the in the presentations uh, that will come, and adding more texture to this to this um, to this illustration um, here, adding the the idea that there's, there's this continuum of informal to formal, but also surrounded by the um, informal systems, so like a constellation of actors that that uh, exchange good services, ideas, knowledge, and they interact uh, at different. Um, uh, levels of intensity uh, and frequency with informal entrepreneurs and this network of actors uh, with different degrees of formality themselves, including informal trainer training uh, organizations, informal financial uh, organizations, uh, um, uh, uh, representative uh, associations, and so on, um, also interact with each other and form this sort of complex web of, of, of actors. And I think it's important to take this, this look because then you start seeing the informal economy as part of the system, as something that is uh, rather than something that is out of it. Uh, so when you start looking at this constellation of actors, you start thinking about what sort of support uh, do we need to provide for these broader innovation systems uh, to be more inclusive and to accommodate the needs and the opportunities and challenges of actors at different degrees of, of formality. So let me stop here. Um, and I would like to, um, to sort of just remind us of the key question of this, uh, of this webinar. Um, can innovation be a driver of, the trans of this transition uh, or pathways towards formality? Um, uh, if, if it can, what is the role of technological innovation, uh, uh, including digital and other technologies, as well as non-technological innovation? And here are some of the questions that we will be uh, addressing. So sort of what types of innovations can enhance uh, the chances for informal business in their pathways towards formality? Um, what are the main challenges? And how can they be better supported uh, by different organizations and from a policy perspective? So I will stop sharing here. Um,
And I will, I'll give the floor to the first uh, speaker, Mariana. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my presentation now. Um, I am not sure if everyone's familiar with the UNDP Accelerator Labs, but I am, a, give me one second so I can set this up. Yes. I am head of exploration for the UNDP Accelerator Lab in Peru. So I want to talk a little bit uh, today about our experiences uh, working with the, the, the poverty reduction and prosperity program in several uh, different projects that relate in a way to uh, different pathways to formality in Peru. So let me just start with a brief context other than what you might have been watching in the news uh, this past couple of weeks. Um, 73% of the labor force here in Peru are informal workers, and they represent 17.7% of GDP. This is based into 2020 figures. Uh, of course, everything that we, every, every single figure that we have uh, currently uh, from that pre-pandemic period is, has significantly changed, but this is the, the latest uh, official numbers that we have. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, about context in of our work with regarding to markets, you're going to figure out why in a second. Uh, we have 30, no, I'm sorry, 300,000 stands in food markets and approximately 70% of them are managed by women. These are the latest figures from the National Association of, of Vendors in Food Markets in Peru. And also another bit of, of information about the country that you will find interesting in two minutes is that we have 1.2 million Venezuelans living in Peru. Um, he, uh, usually it's thought that um, Colombia has the most Venezuelan, um, um, I mean, Colombia, I mean, the, the probably Bogota or Cucuta have the most Venezuelans living in, in their cities. But as we speak, Lima is the city outside of Venezuela with the most Venezuelans. This means that out of every 10 people living in Lima, one of them is uh, from migrant or refugee population coming from Venezuela. And if you can imagine, uh, we have to approximately 10 million people in Lima, which means that we have 1 million people, uh, 1 million Venezuelans living with us here. Now, why am I sharing all these random bits of facts and information to show? Well, I want to uh, go into the kind of, of work that we're doing with our colleagues in the, uh, the Prosperity and Poverty Reduction Program here in Peru. Um, I'm talking about three ongoing interventions and why ongoing? Because they are happening as we, I mean, they had a first stage where we learned, we piloted both, uh, in the three of them, we have worked uh, with the, the program, with the, the, the team, the whole team actually, in designing uh, pilots that can be later scaled or, or adapted or replicated, or even, you know, just scratched if they don't work. That's a good, uh, that's, that, that's one of the, the pillars of the type of work that we do accelerate in the accelerator labs is that we have a space for learning what works and what doesn't. And knowing what doesn't work is also valuable data points for us. So we have worked in this three different programs uh, project, sorry, uh, targeting different uh, different audiences, but they all converge in within this single um, topic, this single idea of they they are different touch points for the informal economy, uh, but they are also different touch points for uh, digitalization initiatives and business or entrepreneurial initiatives. So in this sense we are, uh, it's almost like an ecosystem and we are trying to enter the ecosystem through different uh, different actors. The first program is called Innova Tu Mercado and it's targeted to our women entrepreneurs in food markets. Um, Peru was one of the, con the countries worst hit by co COVID. We had the highest uh, rate of, of, of deaths due to COVID and this impacted also, of course, every single aspect of the Peruvian economy, but mostly food markets, because they were showcased, they were um, 
they were made to be points of contagion, which implied that uh, a lot of people stopped going to food markets. And food markets are not by themselves uh, just a place where you have transactions happening all the time. There are centers of community, there are cultural centers, there are places where relationships are built, where, where communities uh, strengthen their everyday bonds, their social capital, which means that once you stopped at going to them, you naturally have this whole domino effect of impacts within the community. You have women losing their sources of income. I mean, men, of course, but women mostly, given that what I mentioned, that 70% of the stalls in food markets are managed by women but, but also you have client you have clients that stop going but clients new ways of targeting new um clients or potential clients that might never have been might not have been to a market before so um this this is this is ongoing we tested it in two markets in lima and now it has expanded to to uh, 15 markets throughout the country this is a very interesting project because it tends, it allows us as a lab and as a program, uh, as a, the, the, the a UNDP, the uh, poverty reduction program, to test new ways of actually outlining a digitalization route and how to think about informality and digitalization as well regarding women women specifically and understanding what are the, the their touch the touch points there their main pain points and and the motivations that we can uh, latch on to uh, the second project that we are doing is targeted to over venezuelan migrants and refugees and the host population which are peruvians mostly um this project um was designed to to build entrepreneurial capabilities within the refugee population. Refugees and the, sorry, migrant and refugee population. Um, I don't know if you know a lot about the Venezuelan migration, um, but several, there are several limitations to their access to jobs in terms of how the law regulates this because there's a maximum percentage of people that you can, you can hire when they're uh, foreigners. Also, there's, of course, a political discourse surrounding this where they are targeted for taking the jobs and actually thinking about uh, about them in terms of, uh, oh, they might be coming for, they're, they're like messing up our, our opportunities here, which is actually not true, but that's another topic for another day. So several of them uh, find entrepreneurship as a, uh, a, a way to, to actually uh, not only to get new sources of income, but actually settle down in the country, find new opportunities, find, uh, make a new life for themselves. Several of them have just arrived into the country with whatever they had on their backs and probably one or two documents and that's it. So you have to build a whole new life here and they're doing that through entrepreneurship. And the third program, the third project, sorry, that we are working on is the formalization lab. Um, it's called, we call it the lab for, uh, this is a project that was born from a previous experience carried out by the Paraguayan lab, which is one of the, the many strengths of the accelerator lab network is that we actually are constantly learning from our, our counterparts. We share information all the time. I'm, I'm sure Gina will tell you more about it, but we heard about this project in Paraguay and this made sense for us. And you're gonna understand why again in a couple of slides. But the idea of the formalization lab is to um, understand what are the motivations and the pain points towards formalis formality for uh, entrepreneurs in specific value chains. So instead of having a punitive approach where you go and say, everyone must formalize, everyone must do this, uh, you go and actually uh, test out different solutions, different options where the user is the user and meaning the, the entrepreneur, the informal or semi-formal entrepreneur is actually put in the center of this, of this, um, of any kind of, uh, of initiative 
and start by asking them and figuring out what are their motivations or their pain points. So we have three different interventions here where the lab, as I mentioned, is working with the uh, Poverty Reduction and Prosperity Program within the UNDP Peru country office. This is, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's the lab's focus for each of these programs, because in each of these projects, sorry, because some of these projects have a larger scope and other activities in which the lab is not involved. Um, that's just, I wanted to give you an overview of what we've been focusing on and how we put together the insights that I'm going to show you later. In Innovar Tu Mercado, like I mentioned, uh, where we target, uh, we work with women entrepreneurs in food markets, our focus has been digitalization. Uh, how to, how to um, make it not only easier, but make it more friendly, make it, um, I mean, maybe just not think of the tools or technology for technology's sake, but how, what is easier, what is better, what actually makes sense for them and what a process that makes sense for them as well, whatever this might imply, whether it's, you know, uh, finding family members that help them or partnering with students in Peru, in Lima's, uh, some universities that can provide support. Um, so our focus was digitalization. Still is a little bit, but we, it has grown and, and expanded. Uh, for Creando, definitely, like I mentioned, entrepreneurship tools for migrants. We I, I put migrant in parentheses because not all. Um, we also target the host population, which are which are Peruvians. So we thought first about migrants, but we discovered later that several of uh, these migrants that we were working on through a six week program, where we provided them different different types of tools, classes. Um, net networking uh, opportunities, mentorship, they also brought along their Peruvian um, uh, partners. It, was, it, it's, it has been a, been a very interesting um, experience in learning how to promote social co cohesion through entrepreneurship. And the last one, the formalization lab, like I mentioned, we... Uh, focus on barriers and motivations to for to become formal. Of course, uh, if you think about it, every single project that we do uh, covers every single one of these three areas of focus, which has been interesting in itself because what we have been able to do is learn from all this and start putting together cross-cutting insights that we can then uh, provide to our partners, even to our within the, the own uh, UNDP country office to improve um, project design. So our, definitely what the kind of innovation that we're bringing that we're putting forward is one, thinking about this in holistic terms, like Erica mentioned, thinking about it in the spectrum is thinking about it in, in this uh, stop think, I'm actually, well, stop thinking about it in terms of black and white formality, informality. Like once you sign a paper, you stop being informal. There are levels to formality and we have to work with them. And also um, the, the way that we are doing this is putting the user, making every single process, every single project, a user-centric experience which uh, the, of course, UNDP is already doing, but we have been pushing it a little bit more, uh, involving the, the, the user, I mean, the audience, whoever we want to work with, uh, involving them in project design. So it's not that they come in a later stage, they come in from the beginning. So what are some of the early insights? I don't want to take uh, too much time, but um, first of all, uh, formality in Peru. Mariana? Sorry. Mariana, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, if you if you don't mind wrapping up in the next uh, minute or two, that would be great. Just so we have. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, I have some. I'm just gonna go through this. Some early insights. Informality in Peru is not gender neutral. It's it has a woman's face, and women are more digital, but are less informal. So we have to think about it in terms of how this also relates to the care economy. Digitalization is an incentive to formality itself. Digitalization is 
not a separate path. It's not unrelated. It's not something that happens by itself. It's also an incentive to maybe later become informal. And COVID has provided an incentive to digitalize. Property for women is a pathway to formality. Formality means uh, for them that they are able to protect what they have achieved, and specifically in terms of property, of physical property. We have creative ways. We have found creative ways to overcome migrant informality. For example, migrants associating with Peruvians, so Peruvians can be the, the face of their businesses in front of authorities and municipalities because them as migrants do not have the tools or do not have are, are probably be, are, are being discriminated against as as people that might not have all the paperwork or might just have just maybe they have just arrived into the country so where to start so we propose four specific uh starting points as a lab that these are on these are changing uh but these are where we are at, at the moment like Erica mentioned, informality is a spectrum and context specific, and not only context in terms of like uh, the moment or the city. It's also terms in terms of uh, the person's history, women, migrants, age. Like Erica mentioned as well, digitalization needs face-to-face -face interaction. Sounds counterintuitive, but to digitalize, you need someone to sit in front of you and help you do it. Usually, it's um, usually we see it through family members, through I don't know nieces, kids, uh, children that help their parents digitalize. Carrots first, sticks don't really work. In informality, we have seen the motivation to formality become comes from protecting what you have already earned, what you have already achieved. Not so much about being worried about potential fines or what the government's going to do to you. That doesn't work. And finally, meet citizens where they are, not where they should be. Some we we come along with uh, lots of ideas about how what how the citizens would should react and what they should do. But honestly, we need to, and this is also it happens in the government a lot. So we have to focus on where they are at the moment and start working with them, not shepherding them along because that doesn't work. Like you said, there are motivations to informality. It's not some kind of irrational, um, irrational. It's not a, I mean, it's not rational informality. It has a, a, a thought process behind it and a, and a set of pain points and motivations to, to, to stay informal or become formal. So uh, just to wrap up, please, if you have any, if you want to learn about any of these projects, please connect with us. My name is Mariano Chese. Franco Villa Garcia is our program officer, and we're happy to share more about these programs and the, the work that we've been doing with uh, in UNDP Peru. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, uh, Mariana. This has been a great presentation. Um, let's, let's move straight to the next one. Uh, it would be great to have some time for, uh, for uh, discussion. So I would ask uh, the presenters to, to try and, and and be as, as as short as possible. Um, but obviously, don't please don't cut into any of the you know important messages that you need to to pass on. So uh, Rua um, uh, Al Abeb, uh, head of solutions mapping, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll get straight into it so we can have time for the discussion. Um, a quick introduction before I get into explaining some of our findings. So. Um, so I'm here, glad to be here to be representing UNDP Jordan and Accelerator Lab. The research and work that we did on understanding the informal economy, just for some context, actually grew out of an existing program within the Livelihoods and Inclusive Growth Program. So they had a they have a, had a project called Heart of Amman, and that includes a component on enter, small enterprises and uh, yeah, formal and informal in East Amman, so in the east of the capital. Uh, and particularly looking at uh, both uh, refugee and whose populations and with a particular interest in women uh, and home-based businesses. So that's where uh, this emerged from. Uh, also, just for some uh, context that you know, what we'll share today, you know, focused on East Amman and actually what we'll share is a focus on the qualitative research that we did, which helped us dive deeper into, um, you know, really understanding the experiences of people in this sector. 
but given that it's in East Amman and it looks at a particular community, there are some limitations that, you know, this part of the city has, you know, the, the demographics, uh, people are have similar demographics. So we, we weren't able to uh, look into some other kinds of informal businesses like uh, creative industry workers, independent freelancers and things like that. So that's just something uh, to keep in mind. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, as I was saying, so we, we, we did some interviews with about 27 informal businesses to deepen our understanding after a quantitative uh, research step. And um, although we talked to both men and women, uh, actually most of them were, were women with home-based businesses, the different kinds of businesses that we uh, learned about uh, varied from food production, carpentry and welding, sewing, beauty services and products, maintenance, handicrafts, uh, and promotional materials. But the ones that were highest in demand for the services were maintenance and repair. And in terms of products, many uh, included accessories, uh, food, cosmetics, body care products. And these were often from the women-headed home-based businesses. When we uh, asked them about why they were in the informal economy, we also got uh, varying answers. Some said that you know they were looking for financial independency. Uh, some said they, they need to make money because they're facing a difficult economic situation. They needed to provide for their families. Uh, maybe they didn't have other options. Um, some also inherited these businesses. Uh, and of course, we also have the specific case of, of refugees who they can't, uh, uh, sorry, can't be part of the informal economy. So or sorry, the formal economy. So they turn to the informal economy as, as an option to, to you know, sustain their livelihoods. Also, we wanted to see if, any, if there was any significant effect from COVID and actually most of the people we talked to had their, business, their informal businesses way before COVID. Uh, so that didn't seem to have, that didn't seem, didn't seem to be the reason, like a reason or a driver for, uh, the formation of these businesses in these cases uh, that was, yeah, not many uh, emerged after the pandemic. Uh, as for digitalization, there were, in, you know, a lot of people mentioned using electronic devices like mobiles and laptops to market their work, to receive orders, to watch online tutorials, and to stay updated on trends. Uh, but they, they also mentioned not having a lot of training on this, and so that's something they felt they needed to learn more about. Uh, and in terms of social protections and health insurance, actually none of them had uh, registration and social security, and the majority don't have health insurance. And even those who do either benefited from family members who have health insurance, or you know, just two of them are part of a program by the Ministry of Social Development that's for uh, poor families, uh, and one specifically because they have a disability. So that's not very common. Um, and when we want, you know, asked them why they, or would they want to formalize, most said they didn't. And uh, the top reasons were that registration, uh, registering their businesses and formalizing um, meant high costs, which they couldn't afford, especially because their operations are really small. So it didn't feel like something that they could afford. And I, you know, there's, there's always this question of like, what's in it for them? What are they gaining uh, from uh, from formalizing. Um, other reasons included preference for having flexible work uh, options. Uh, and again, the, the issue of being a refugee and not being able to have a work permit uh, came up. Um, that said, some did mention advantages that they saw in formalizing, such as having peace of mind, meaning you know they always lived in fear that the government would crack down on them, that they could promote their work more openly. So perhaps there's a fear of you know, being too public about their work in some cases, that they expand, have more income, uh, take out a loan, and in some cases gain customer trust because sometimes they felt that people didn't necessarily uh, trust the work or like see it as valid uh, in, in some cases if it's not uh, formal or compared to a formal business. Um, also related to formalization, we learned that actually about half don't know anything about the laws and regulations related to their work, and some don't want to know. Uh, this could be because their business is small, and so they, again, didn't feel it's worth uh, looking into the formalization. And uh, others said because they're refugees, so this is not something that they're uh, concerned about because they can't register. 
Um, some purely know about the, the laws and regulations out of curiosity, and very rarely one or two said that they look they know the laws well because either they wanted to formalize but didn't end up doing it, or because they're thinking about potential future pathways. Um, in terms of the, the main challenges that we heard about, so the main one is actually a lack of resources and resources looks like there are different kinds of resources. The main one was lack of tools, uh, followed by lack of materials and space to be able to do their work or to sell products and services. And also something that came up uh, several times was that also similar to the previous presentation, uh, women and specifically married women have some particular challenges uh, in this field and three of them shared like specific cases. One said she can't work outside of her house because her husband won't allow it or uh, her husband just won't allow her to leave the house or expand her you know, relationships beyond friends, acquaintances or neighbors. And another felt that she has too many responsibilities at home, you know, take care and care of her family. So she didn't want to go beyond uh, working at, at her business at a, in a home-based uh, uh, format. Uh, so those were some of the biggest issues, but then also in terms of uh, other challenges, many, many mentioned lack of funding, and this could be to buy the tools and space and materials or rent uh, to do their work. Also several talked about public transportation challenges and being able to deliver uh, their products and services. Um, also several didn't have information on funding. So most didn't even know about opportunities. Some applied, but only one got uh, some funding uh, and others don't really know how to apply. Um, others mentioned as discussed a bit earlier, you know, they didn't uh, have, they don't have work permits and uh, lack uh, business registration and also don't really feel that they are strong in marketing uh, their work and don't have a lot of experience with social media marketing and online marketing. Um, as for innovations or solutions, to be frank, in this case, we didn't feel there were really innovations per se uh, in terms of how the work was being done or in the products themselves, but we did feel that people were using certain tactics and ad adaptations to be able to get their work done. Uh, this includes marketing tactics such as like providing a gift with an order to encourage people to buy again, uh, money saving and, mar um, and money making tactics. So like, for example, many people go attend bazaars that could be organized by international organizations or community-based organizations or NGOs. And there are some cases where you don't have to pay rent for a table. So they will choose to only sell there. Uh, in terms of getting services, some uh, actually have some connection to formal businesses like as service providers or clients, like making promotional materials or providing services to a hotel. Uh, and then there are several adaptations, um, one of which is um, feeling that working at home is actually a way to avoid the limitations caused by not having a work permit or business registration. And then several actually adaptations, which basically involved borrowing from friends and family or collaborating. So this includes uh, borrowing tools, materials, and space, uh, although they preferred to have their own, but you know, this was the, you know, their backup, uh, you know, option. Uh, also borrowing money because they don't have enough capital or funding uh, and borrow, collaborating with a friend or neighbor to fill a gap in their skill set. So for example, a woman said, I don't know how to use Facebook. So my her friend will, is the one who runs her Facebook page and helps her reach customers. Uh, also borrowing, you know, depending on family or friends for transportation since they can't, they don't have their own. Uh, and that transportation, meaning if they need to get around or if they need to uh, deliver something to a client. Uh, and in terms of the different um, concerns they had for the future and ideas they have for how they want to develop their businesses, most of them said they want to improve their business by growing it or improving the quality. Again, they mentioned, you know, if they could have more financing and funding that would help them with uh, production times, better quality and higher production volumes. Uh, about a third said they would like to learn more about digital marketing uh, and how to advertise and grow their network. And also some said that, you know, having a delivery service or car could help out uh, with some of their challenges. In terms of some of their concerns more generally, um, 
four of them said that you know they have concerns about their health. Uh, so you know not having health insurance and not having so much stability means that you know they're not sure if their health situation could affect their work in the future. Others said that they're not sure if they could continue their businesses, uh, whether that's because they couldn't sell or because increase in prices of materials or their refugee status or complaints from neighbors, you know, knowing that they're working on an informal basis. Uh, some also said expanding the business uh, was their, you know, what they saw as the solution to this concern. Some felt that they're going to be forced to look for other side jobs or you know, how they're going to apply for grants and get the funding that they haven't been able to get. Um, and also, you know, being able to have a, a sticking to a health plan or having a health plan uh, or, or working reasonable hours because they're often can be working around the clock to be able to make, uh, you know, make ends meet. So in terms of, you know, also how we see- uh, sorry, sorry, what to we interrupt. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, if you, if you don't mind wrapping up uh, in, in a minute or so. Thank you. Yes. So to wrap up, uh, you know, looking at what's needed and moving forward, we feel that um, actually some of the innovation that could happen could be in the sphere of, of re regulation. So making the process uh, to register easier and less costly and also looking into different um, tiers of regulation or formalization. So there isn't one way of formalization, but perhaps there's like semi-formalization. Also looking into financing that is specifically catered to informal businesses and, and refugees and women in this particular case. Uh, we also have um, uh, we also had some like ideas about how we could kind of listen or understand the informal sector better. So, as an example, in this case, we uh, one of our methods was basing our entire kind of res or our research questions on the perceptions of people and their understanding uh, from of the informal economy, the, the actual informal workers. So, using pictures also to help them express you know how they feel about different aspects of the economy so we're also thinking about you know other ways of understanding the informal sector like could be through radio mining or um, doing you know more in-depth interviews something we're still exploring um, and for the sake of time i'll stop there and i'll leave uh, time for questions to find out more and you can i'll, I'll share the blogs that we wrote on the work uh, in the chat if you want to learn more Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, it was very, very rich. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to, to read. I could see that it would be great to, if you could share the, the links on the, on the chat. And there's a couple of, um, there's a question already regarding uh, the kind of incentives or preferences uh, that, that maybe you would like to think about when we get to the questions and answers. So um, thank you so much for that, for that great presentation. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Richard uh, Dobson, who is the director of uh, ASIE et Akuleni um, in South Africa. Thank you, Erica. Let me share my screen. Um, has that come up? Yep. Um, so first of all, thank you for, you can't, can you hear me properly? Can you just nod, Erica? Can you hear me properly? We, we can, we can hear yep. you and we can see the slides, but okay. they are not in Thanks very much. Um, so first of all, greetings and thank you for the inv invitation. Um, I've based my presentation on the idea of pathways. Um, I think it's a word now that a lot of us are using. It seems to have surfaced over the last couple of uh, months almost. Um, but of course, pathways are literal in the sense that they are direction finders and they have an outcome. But also, I think with respect to informality, um, they are incredibly powerful um, visual signals. And from my experience, Informal workers um, experience the prejudice and the harassment because of the visual appearance of the work they do, the tools they use. And so I have based my presentation on mainly it's, it's visual heavy um, and midway in the presentation, I will uh, draw some conclusions around a small case study 
and then at the end I'll put up some uh, word prompts which might uh, stimulate some uh, discussion. So first, uh, in South Africa, we must also remember, we've uh, really highlighted that context is king. Um, South Africa, of course, comes from an apartheid past when uh, particularly black people were excluded from cities completely. So there has a long, long history of people and particularly informal workers trying to find an urban presence. And so right from colonial days, then into apartheid days, traditional medicine has been hugely prejudiced in South Africa. And so if one is going to start to um, give some prominence to that activity, to dignify it, in the particular area within the inner city of Durban, South Africa, to accommodate that new activity and to form it into a market, there was literally no space in which that could happen. Um, so we were able to get permission to utilize an unutilized portion of a freeway network um, into that install a linear market. And over the years, um, that's when it was first installed and operational. That is now the market that functions in that area, over 2,000 uh, vendors who operate a traditional market. But as you can see straight away, it's now um, been foregrounded. Um, with that, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we, we, the slides are not moving from our side. It's not on presentation okay. mode. Okay, let me just go back, please. Richard, I think you need to put it into slideshow mode. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. Oh, no, well, no, it's still, is the next slide, but it's still not on presentation mode. So I think if you click at the, on the bottom right, next I to the I Zoom. I was doing that. Um, yeah, next to the, that one, yes. Let me see, I thought I was doing that. Is it not moving? Is it moving now? Now it is, now it is. It is, a okay. Equipment. All right, um, okay, in the interest of time, I will continue. Um, the second is a practice uh, here, which is really now starting to come into food sovereignty, but it's a whole question, which is an international challenge about how do you foreground traditional foods? Um, and in this instance, it's the uh, local delicacy of eating uh, the meat that's um, on the, head of, of cows, it's cleaved from the, from the bone, but how do you then start to bring that in as an urban practice? Huge challenges just in terms of how the meat is prepared, the drainage, how it is then served, and then how do you then start to foreground that um, and develop and grow people's enterprises? In this instance, it's a co-design process of creating little kitchens, still uh, reserving the the cooking practice, which is obviously contributes to the flavor of the meat, but that then brings forward challenges about how the meat is now cooked in a more contained environment instead of out in the, in the street. And so the whole question of bioefficiency in terms of, uh, and this intersects obviously with, with climate change. And then ultimately starting to have a pathway where you bring an informal practice um, into almost mainstream in terms of how it's presented um, in the urban space. And then corn on the cob, again, very much um, uh, food sovereignty, but the practice rural almost brought into an urban space. How do you then start to organize that in a way which deals with a lot of the urban externalities? The city then redeveloped that site uh, just recently without any consultation, I might say which started to generate all sorts of challenges, particularly in terms of health and hygiene, uh, heat from the stoves, and then ultimately our development of a bioefficient stove, which started to look at minimizing the heat loading, the um, pollution effects, um, and a, obviously a healthier way of cooking uh, the meal. And then slightly different, um, a huge big urban space, but I think this image, if we were talking about pathways and visualization, this is probably the most common challenge that informal workers have about literally what their work looks like in public spaces. Because they're harassed, they're unable to retain um, urban equipment and furniture, which is confiscated, destroyed. Um, they are obviously always under investing in their equipment. Um, and they also 
um, borrowing um, equipment and of course it doesn't really start to suit um, kind of the urban elite in terms of what it looks like. So in this instance, it was transforming that space into virtually an Italian Galleria. And then straight away, you're able to minimize the top structures um, and then create an urban space of significance, which starts to foreground um, and dignify uh, the informal activity. And then probably what's almost very typical, certainly here in the South in Africa, again, borrowed equipment, um, salvaged materials, um, affordability levels that um, you're able to access. Um, but of course, the signal that that sends is one of, of temporariness um, and very simple transformation that you can bring about as soon as you start to bring an urban scale and an urban presence to that um, with an urban aesthetic that some people might consider uh, more acceptable. And then, of course, you have other activities. We are now, now looking at individual activities on the street, the survivalist activities and what they are driven to in terms of the equipments that they use and how easy that is to intervene just in terms of equipment, safety gear, and how you can actually change that narrative. And then at a different scale, and um, we've already mentioned pandemics, but in terms of how you intervene at a completely different level, in this instance, um, where the pressure was for alcohol-based sanitizers, which weren't affordable, and um, the alcohol evaporated in strong, strong heat of the day, um, the fierce heat of the day at least. So how could you actually build what were known as wash stations and um, that used um, just uh, soap um, as the um, sanitizer, but out of materials that could easily be accessed um, for informal workers to use themselves. And then within the care economy, one of the biggest challenges there is infrastructure. So in this instance, it was piloting really the four or five key elements of any care facility, which is the nappy changing, food preparation, mattress storage, um, and then the little sick bay. And how can you then accommodate that in the street in a way which brings the care to the street and to the worker? And then just for a bit of lighthearted entertainment, how you can set up a care crate, um, basically a care facility in 20 seconds. So the idea is that these crates um, are, the, in fact, they're a mimic of the storage facilities that informal workers use on the street. So the reference for these crates is indigenous, as it were. And so now to draw together with a little bit of a case study, I think anyone would look at this picture and they could see quite literally that it is in fact not, not a pathway to recognition. Um, a person's forced to use borrowed equipment. Um, that borrowed equipment not only sends a signal that you're a temporary occupier of that space, you are uncertain about the occupation that you're doing. Um, you are a survivalist, as I referred to earlier. It's quite likely that the constraints of your cart, maybe these two people work together and all that material could have been carried on one efficient cart. Signage that you are forced to use because the city officials confiscate it because you're not allowed to put it up. So you don't invest in the proper signage compared to formal businesses signage. So all the signals are there just in terms of the urban aesthetic. And then of course, you've got the work gear, no um, safety boots, no protection at all, um, no gloves, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you start to intervene very literally to change that narrative, as I said earlier? In this example, which we will show um, pre-existing conditions, I've already showed you the slide, how you can just intervene in a way to start to order that activity you can change the lives of the individuals. But you also need to interact on the urban space. And in this instance, locating an urban park um, that was available to possibly be developed as a facility for um, these workers to um, occupy. But here, the site was allocated, as I said, as a park, and we knew we weren't going to be able to access it. So we developed the idea of um, what we call the 17 tree park. Um, and for those of you that don't know, notionally you save 17 trees for every ton of cardboard that you re uh, recycle. 
So we sold this to the city at the idea of the 17 tree park as a literal visual um, beacon of the recycling activity. It then got this facility um, on the corner, detail of the final plan, the 17 trees, but this is what it looks like on its completion. So I think we want to make the point that it is not only just the intervention with the individuals in terms of um, their presence, but also the workplace as such, um, and setting it in an urban environment that acknowledges um, that this is a um, recognized and dignified activity. And in addition to these interventions, other interventions in terms of working in the, on the space, in the sidewalks. Well, Richard, towards... uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, if you, if you don't mind wrapping up in the next minute or so. Yeah, no, did two more slides. Um, and then intervening with um, carts themselves, the conveyances, all these are on our website. But you can't have a cart and give people new equipment if they are not given guidelines about how they can care for it. Um, and so a whole manual that went with uh, some of these carts. And in conclusion, some, uh, some thoughts. Clearly, we all like to um, aspire to be participative and we work towards co-design, co-creation, but we know all those have limitations. Um, and so for us, the question of pilots is incredibly important because a lot of the activity that we initiate um, as um, practitioners ultimately starts with some sort of top-down initiative. So pilots are a way in which we can start to bring in these processes which we all like to laud and believe in. Context, we've already mentioned, it's absolutely significant, but that context is both at scale and it's also thematic. Um, and I, the fact that I've deliberately brought in urban, um, I think is a provocation in this discussion. Strategic and pragmatic, both of course are important and they need to be held in tension. And lastly for us, it's a question of the funding dilemma. The funding dilemma, it is obviously the shortage of funding in itself, but many funders are precluded from funding because they believe that all this work um, that we're engaged in should be the responsibility of government and local government. Um, and so finding funding that would start to create this pathway um, is an incredible uh, challenge. And I'll leave it at that. That was great. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Richard. This has given us a lot of, um, uh, a lot of very different examples and very interesting examples, food for thought. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, so I don't, I don't want to take any time reflecting myself, um, but thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we, we will move to, um, to Gina uh, uh, next to provide a, a few reflections uh, on, on the three presentations. Gina Lucarelli from the uh, UNDP Accelerator Lab Team Leader. Um, if you don't mind spending uh, perhaps three minutes or so, just giving your, your quick thoughts about the three presentations before we open up for questions and answers. Thank sure, you. thanks, Erica. And I think we do wanna preserve the time for questions and answers and discussion. There's some things happening in the chat, but great if we can um, make up for some time here. Um, so, so, let's see let me just offer kind of four four points trying to connect these stories um that we've heard the first i think is um i think what we're seeing here is um us as a development community learning to see innovations in places we don't often see them right so here erica building on this um perspective of the informal economy as a test bed of innovation here we're taking it a step further um and and filling out okay what does that mean and what are the implications um of that it is indeed probably not um a radical innovation um but more of an incremental one to start to see development um as listening to people closest to the problem um or people closest to the opportunity whatever you see the informal economy as so as we've seen from the work that rua has done um in jordan and the work that mariana is doing um, and the work that Richard shared with us just now, um, getting closer to people who are actually running informal businesses obviously brings you insights that you would never, never see. Secondly, I think um, 
I think we, you know, you mentioned that one of the ways of seeing the informal economy is as a byproduct of globalization. I think we see a trend here, at least between the work in Peru and the work in Jordan. This is also a byproduct of migration, right? You could say migration is a part of globalization, but here I think we see a little bit of a pattern where um, Mm, people who are excluded from the labor market or don't understand it or don't know how to access it uh, see this sort of informal entrepreneurship as an alternative to what they see as an impossible entry into into the formal economy. Um, so clearly here we're starting to see, you know, it's almost a sub subheading of the informal economy as a byproduct of globalization. There's also a migration component here or you know, refugee status, depending on status, that, um, that is definitely emerging. Um, I think there's a question you know, here on whether or not uh, migrants or refugees entrance into the informal economy is sort of a response to you know, a regulatory problem. Um, I'm sure economists would ask, you know, are they acting rationally? So we heard from Rua that indeed of the 27 informal businesses that she surveyed in East Amman, that, um, that there is cognizance of the benefits of formalization, peace of mind, growing the business, et cetera, et cetera. However, they still remained reluctant to do so given the, you know, the fear, the lack of understanding of the environment, and maybe even actual legal blockages. So, so there is some, some, um, I don't know what you call that in economic terms going on there, but some question of, of what's driving this and, and where the beginning is. I think thirdly, we're definitely seeing uh, digitization um, as the most clear incentive, um, the most clear, let's say, pathway to formality, if that's the way we're talking about uh, these things. Uh, Mariana definitely mentioned that. Um, and that's something that we also see in our work um, across the UNDP Accelerator Lab network, uh, beyond Peru and Jordan, but but in, I would say, another, I don't know, 30 or 40 countries or so where we see patterns on informality and work in that area, we definitely see that digitization does reduce that idea of thinking in binary terms, right? There's the formal economy, that's the real economy, and then there's the informal economy, which is illegal, um, which, you know, it doesn't uh, have innovation, um, et cetera. So digitization reduces that in or out feeling. It, it changes the dynamic where pathways to formality become market-led because people depend on uh, Meta as a company, Facebook or WhatsApp to gain customers, to uh, do marketing, et cetera. Um, and so, so this market-led uh, pathway to formality has many benefits uh, because it reduces some of the barriers. It reduces some of the intermediaries in the value chain. However, it also has downsides since that it's highly dependent on uh, on large uh, tech corpora corporations and people's access, of course, uh, to technology and the internet uh, and what have you. Um, I would say though that we saw um, from Mariana, I really like uh, your framing around, you know, carrots, uh, not sticks. Um, and I'd say, you know, um, certainly the transformation of urban spaces is a non-digital uh, carrot um, that might incentivize some informal businesses um, to move along on their pathways to formality. Um, and so there maybe what we're learning from Richard's work is um, indeed a policy option for municipalities or governments at any level who are uh, trying to integrate the informal economy into their economic um, landscape, um, that maybe the transformation of urban space is the, the you kind of like front loading that investment um, in those spaces um, is a good policy option. Um, it's probably one that's hard to convince people to do uh, because again, often those stalls are seen as illegal or a nuisance or an environmental hazard, but perhaps being bold and investing in transformation of the urban spaces is, is a very good stick to incentivize pathways towards informality alongside digitization, which we also see as the strongest one so far. Great, Gina, very, very useful set of reflections and thanks for putting everything 
sort of together finding that golden thread between <laughs> between all the presentations. I thought it was great. Um, I would like we we are quite short with time, uh, but the, the presentations have been so rich and so um, so useful. I mean, I think we would have missed out if we didn't have the chance to listen to everything that that people had to share. Um, uh, we have a little bit of time for questions and answers, um, five minutes or so before we 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 wrap up. Um, there is one one question that was uh, posed in the chat. Um, about the kinds of incentives that that uh, that entrepreneurs uh, needed to get the business formalized. That's for the case of Jordan. Um, and I, I would like to maybe open the floor to see if there's any hands up. We can take maybe three questions and give the speakers a chance to um, to give the final the responses and final thoughts. Any hands up? Okay, uh, perhaps you can you can go ahead and, and, and answer the question in the meantime. Erwa. Sure, so uh, thanks for the question also. So we, we didn't ask the question directly. We didn't ask them like what would incentivize you or encourage you to formalize, but from what we heard about the barriers, uh, some of the things that we think could help are to lower the cost of registration, to make the process easier, because from what we know, there's like lots of paperwork and uh, it can be a pain <laughs> to register. Uh, to formalize. Um, also, since many of them don't know much about the laws and regulations, perhaps them knowing a bit more might help them understand what they could, how they could benefit. Um, in one of the workshops we did uh, with uh, stakeholders from like private sector and government and other organizations that are not in the informal economy, you know, to hear from their perspective, you know, what uh, they know about um, what could benefit the informal sector based on their you know, the challenges they shared. Someone, I believe from the government, uh, from the municipality mentioned that actually these businesses would be exempt from the taxes for the first two years if they registered. So maybe maybe many of these people are not aware of the fact that they would be exempt. Uh, I also read a, an article about uh, the current policies for formalizations for small businesses. And uh, it seems that they're, like I'm not an expert on this, but it seems that the current policies kind of, Clump different uh, types of informal businesses into one category, which then loses the nuance that is needed for different types of businesses. So, you know, being more nuanced with policies uh, could also be helpful. Uh, also, um, some women mentioned that the customs, like taxes uh, for bringing in raw material, is quite high. So, reducing that would also help. And also, in terms of cost, there's like different rates for the water and electricity costs when you're registered formally. So having more, uh, cons you know, special consideration for these informal businesses that want to register to lower these uh, water and electricity costs would also help. And then uh, this is a specific case, but we've also been looking into tourism uh, for the past few months. And as part of that, also hearing about the informal sector within the tourism work. And we're learning that uh, it's really expensive to formalize in a tourism sector, for example, being a formal tour guide uh, with like a license is, is really expensive and also it can take some time and uh, yeah, can also be kind of complicated. So that's why a lot of them are informal tour guides. So also thinking about specific sectors and what could be made easier or less expensive might encourage people to uh, formalize. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that elaborated uh, answer. That, that, was, that was that was great. Uh, Daniel, do you you have a, your hand up? Please go ahead. I had uh, questions for the colleagues from the accelerate, accelerator labs, uh, in particular. Uh, I think taking off a little bit where um, Richard le left off. Uh, I think it is very important. Uh, I mean, we have seen today examples of excellent pilots, but I think moving from pilots, which can be successful based on the context uh, where they are set. It is very important to think about scaling up, especially from the perspective of country offices. How do you see the process of going from successful pilots for certain subcategories of individuals, be those migrants or you name it, to actual uh, you know, large scale interventions that are embedded in formal 
uh, channels through you know, municipalities, central governments, uh, you name it. That was the first question. And the second question that I had relate more to, do we have any examples of using behavioral insights to nudge people uh, toward uh, formalization, anything that has happened in countries uh, in that direction? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I'll also take uh, Mariana's question now before giving the speakers uh, a minute to, to wrap up and, and to well, answer. I, I can answer the first question actually. Um, mm -hmm. With uh, in terms of a specific one of the three uh, projects that I presented, Innova to Mercado was uh, piloted in two uh, markets in Lima. Um, actually, the central market in Lima, which is fairly important, and then it was scaled. That the pilot happened last year, and this year it was scaled to fifteen uh, markets in all over the country. And next year, we're planning to expand even more. I think it's about to 200 markets in the country. What has been essential in terms of expanding and scaling is one, um, finding partners that want to implement it with you. I mean, we can't do it all. And we have found several uh, private sector partners that have helped us specifically because they have, they, they are, there are ge geographic areas that are of their interest particularly those in extractive industries, for example, or, or electricity, or even you know, any other uh, business that um, they want to work uh, to make sure that entrepreneurs in their area are actually uh, being digitalized. So they have been involved. We have found new partners, that, like I mentioned, that want to work with us in terms of providing their expertise, bringing in volunteers from their own countries, from their, sorry, from their own businesses that, that want to participate in this and help us expand specifically, for example, the digital transformation route that needs a lot of hand-holding within it. Um, that's, um, that's one. And for Creando, we are, uh, again, we have part, found new partners, local partners, specifically universities in other areas of the country outside of Lima that have a strong uh, presence of migrants as well. So what we're doing is instead of scaling up, we're scaling it out. I think Gina can talk more about this, <laughs> scaling it out to think about new partners and new different, uh, I mean, it's been redundant, but new new scales of the same program. So instead of saying we're going to do something virtual for 600 people, it's like, why don't we do something in person for 20 people and see how that works with a local partner? So we're fight, we're actually testing new ways of scaling the different programs. So it might not be more people, might be different um, different settings in person with students versus doing it with experts from private sector. So. Uh, we want to see what works even our scaling up or out or down it's it's or i'm uh, sorry deep it's it's also a test in itself but yeah we're scaling it thanks thanks mariana i, I can see that we've hit the the o'clock uh, time uh, but i would like to give an opportunity uh, uh to richard to uh to also respond since uh, rua and mariana had a, had a chance uh, as, a, as a last intervention before uh, I pass it out to, to Dania to, uh, to, uh, to conclude the, the, the webinar. So Richard, please, if you can- Eric, I don't think minutes. I've got anything particular I could add to, to those questions at this stage, yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, well, uh, we, we've, uh, we see that people already have to, um, to start moving on to other things. So I would like to, uh, to thank everybody. I, I can see that Natalie has also um, uh, left the meeting and, and, and left a message for everybody encouraging people to participate and contribute to the platform. Uh, and, and she's thanked everybody um, uh, in, in the chat. So I will add to that and, and say thank you to all the presenters uh, and pass it on to Dania. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, colleagues, for participating today. I think it was an incredibly interesting uh, session with lots of very good examples of the work that uh, is being done. I am not going to take any more of your time. I think the, the main message that I want to convey is that this is the first of a series of webinars. 
So in other words, we, we this was the kickoff, but we will be in the months to come, we'll be having a lot more webinars around the issue of informality, uh, different topics. So we'll, of course, we're also open to suggestions on additional issues that you'd like to pursue uh, further. That's it from my uh, side. Thanks again for participating and see you in other events. Thank you.